focusing on a risala, on a small uh, booklet by Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, rahimahullah. So, this whole uh, session, inshallah, is about that particular uh, subject. And the topic of his risala, his small advice, is the muqaswati al qalbi. It says, criticizing the hardness of the heart. The muqaswati al qalbi. And he begins by saying, Rahimahullah, and Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, I mean, I don't think I need to introduce Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, he's a great scholar. Uh, on the tradition of uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and his uh, student Ibn al-Qayyim, he benefited from uh, what they said and what they have taught, rahimahumullah ajma'een. And he specializes really uh, in uh, the softeners of the heart and talking about the hereafter and discussing the ailments of the heart and their cures. And he has this uh, uh, inclination to talk about these topics and offer them in an insightful way. So he says, رسالة في ذم قسوة القلب. So this is a, a treatise or an advice about criticizing the hardness of the heart وذكر أسبابها and talking about its causes وما تزول به and the things that remove it. So briefly, he's going to be talking about this. And of course, the topic is greater than what he has offered. But it actually, what he has done is that did offer some insights into or some keys into the topics itself. So he says, Amma the Mulqaswa says, as for criticizing the hardness of the heart, the stiffness of the heart, he says, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Thumma qasat qulubukum min ba'di dalik, fahiya kal hijarati aw ashaddu qaswa. He says, Allah says, and then your hearts then hardened afterwards. So he's speaking to Banu Israel, the Israelites. He says, then your hearts hardened after that. Then they became, became like stones or harder than stones. So then he explained, Ibn Rajab, he says, then Allah Azza wa explained how did their hearts become even harder than stones? Because Allah continues to say, and this is in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَإِنَّ مِنَ الْحِجَارَةِ لَمَا يَتَفَجَّرُ مِنْهُ الْأَنْهَارِ He says, among rocks and stones, rocks and stones that break and out of which water come out, comes out. So even with, despite their hardness, they can break to allow water to come through them. وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَشَّقَّقُ فَيَخْرُجُ مِنْهُ الْمَاءِ and among them are those that crack and the water comes out of. And among them, those rocks or stones, are some that fall down out of the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he says that the people of the book suffered, suffered that fate, which is their hearts had become hard like rocks or even worse than that. And then also he says, and Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Alam yani lil ladina amanu an taqsha akhulubuhum li dikrilla." He says, "Isn't it about time for those who believe that for their hearts to soften and to be humble when they receive the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jalla and the, and the truth that had been revealed, and not be like the people of the book before them, where a long time had passed and their hearts had become hard, فقست قلوبهم." Then he says also, Allah says, فَوَيْلُوا لِلْقَاسِيَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ مِنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ He says, woe to those whose hearts are hard when Allah's remembrance is there. When Allah is remembered, when His signs are uh, uttered, when His uh, ayahs are repeated, their hearts harden. He says, woe to them. So Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran tells us that this is a sickness. What is the sickness? The hardening of the heart. That is, it is so important that Allah Azza wa in the Quran told us that people before us suffered that fate. The heart can become as stone. If it is not taken care of, the heart can become like stone. And that this is a tendency that he said to the believers, early believers, the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, beware not to be like those who were before you. Qala ba'du salaf لا يكون أشد قس أشد قسوة من صاحب الكتاب إذا قسى. He says, no heart will be harder than the heart of the people or the person who has knowledge of the book when it hardens. I want you to think about this. He says that if you are a person who has knowledge and you allow your heart to harden, he says nothing will be stiffer and harder than your heart. Now, do you know why that is the case? Because they have knowledge and they rejected 
what Allah has said. So he says, it's not like any other heart. Like the poor ignorant can have a heart that is hard. But it still is able to soften when it is taught and when it is reminded. But when the person receives the truth and what do they do with it? They reject it. Not just forget, no. They reject. So when that ha happens, the heart has turned against what Allah has revealed. And when the heart turns against Allah's revelation, it hardens like no other heart. So you will know what the truth is. You will have no doubt about it, but you will not only neglect it, but you will also fight it. You will also fight it. So this will answer your question or a question that some people have. How is it that so-and-so knows the truth, but they decide to ignore it? Or they know the truth, but they decide to fight it? Why? It's not that they are ignorant. But what has happened? Is that they have rejected it internally, and because of that, they have been deprived from the blessing, and they deprive themselves of the blessing of following it, so they don't want to follow it, even though they know that it is true. Out of ego, out of envy, out of uh, uh, pride, they don't want to follow it. And so their heart becomes like stone. Nothing affects it. Nothing can help it. And so they become also without mercy and without fear of Allah and without loving of Allah Azza wa Jal. That also answers your question that some people have, which is what? So and so knows the truth. He knows more than I do. How is it that he errs and makes mistakes? How is it that he or she, they can say these things which are plainly false? Did you ever have that question? Maybe. How is it that so-and-so knows so much, and if they know so much, they probably have it a lot easier than I do, but how is it that they make this mistake or defend this falsehood? Why? Yeah, they know more than you do. But what is missing? The heart. Because if a person knows and they reject to resist that truth and not to follow it, then the heart will harden to such an extent that they will find the truth even though that they would know it. So it's not enough that you know. Remember when, we talk, when we're talking about the manners of knowledge, it's not enough that you know. You have to know and you have to follow what you have. Otherwise what you know, can, is you, what you know will turn against you. And you will turn against what you know. He says, Malik ibn, ibn Dinar said, Ma durima abdun a'zam min qalb. He says, no one had been, is afflicted or is punished with something more severe than the stiffness and the hardness of their heart. No one had been afflicted and punished with something that is more severe than the hardness and the stiffening of their heart. If we do a mistake, okay, especially those who are, who are sensitive that Allah Azza wa is watching, what, are the thing that, what is the thing that we'll be afraid of in this dunya when we commit a mistake? That Allah is going to do what? Punish us. Sahih? So if we are sensitive, and if you are that sensitive, then you are fortunate, by the way. Okay, some of us, you know, I've even lost that. But if you commit a mistake, you'll be afraid that Allah will punish me for it. What type of punishment do we expect? Give me examples. You do something wrong, and you say, okay, Allah may punish me. What type of punishment do you expect? Huh? Health, no, in this dunya, I mean. Because there's punishment in this dunya, and there's punishment in the hereafter. So punishment in this dunya. What type of punishment could you expect or you be afraid of when you say, I've done something wrong? Hmm? Yeah, you become sick. You say, what if I become sick? Hmm? Uh, money, you mean? Ah, so you lose your money, right? Depri that, that's, the, that's the worst of it. That's the worst of it. So mostly when we are afraid, we're afraid of what? Oh, my car is going to break down. Allah is going to punish me. This car is not going to be working anymore. Or I'm going to be ducked a day's pay. Right? They're going to take away my salary. They're going to take away my bonus. Uh, my son will become sick. So we're thinking or afraid of physical things. Rightfully so. But Malik ibn Yunar says, he says, the greatest punishment is the punishment where your heart becomes hard. Here, your body is healthy and your, your affairs are in order. But inside... You've died a little bit. You don't care. 
He says, that's the greatest punishment. So if you find yourself that you're sinning and disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal and you don't care, and you do more of it and you don't care, know that you're experiencing a sort of punishment that you brought upon yourself. But you're experiencing a sort of punishment. So the living heart is a ni'mah from Allah. And the heart as it die is a punishment upon a person or upon a people or upon a nation. Huh? So he says that is the greatest punishment. And another person said the same thing. No one was afflicted with something greater and more severe than the stiffness of his heart. He says, Rahimahullah, he was talking about the causes. Okay? What are the causes? He says, Minha kathratul kalami dhikrillah. He says, one of the causes of the stiffness of the heart is to excessively speak but not about Allah or not while remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Speak about worldly matters excessively and be neglectful of Allah. Kathratul kalami dhikrillah. To speak much but not about the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Now he had based this on a hadith, that hadith is weak, that says in it here, لا تكثر الكلام بغير ذكر الله It says, do not speak often about other than the remembrance of Allah Azza wa That hadith is weak, but the meaning in general is accurate, is valid. What is the meaning here? It's not telling you here to not speak anything but the Quran, to not speak anything but the dhikr of Allah. It's not saying this. But it's saying that the more and more and more and more that you engage in other than the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal, the more and more and more and more that your heart will harden. And the remedy for that, of course, as we will see, is to remember Allah Azza wa Jal. But if you spend your day and you're talking about this and you're talking about that and this dunya and that dunya and this dunya and that dunya, especially if there is haram in it or if there's no haram initially, there's haram eventually. Or if you're joking around and kidding and this and that, and you're going to be excessively talking about things that you're not supposed to talk about. The more that you keep talking about these things, the more that you will feel that your heart had become solid. Not soft, but had solidified, had become hard. Why? Because you did not talk about what pleases Allah Azza wa but you're talking about so many other things. Some are okay and some are not. So when we're going to be talking about remedies, we're going to be addressing this issue. But kathratul kalami bighayri dhikrillah. When you talk about everything else, I bought and she bought. And I did and he did. And he said to me and they said to me, etc, etc, etc. So you're not keeping the company of Allah Azza wa Jal, but you're keeping the company of people. And typically, in general, when you keep the company of other people, your iman goes up or goes down, in general. Down. The company of other people. We need other people. We need to talk. We need to socialize. But I'm talking about extremes and excessiveness without the moderating effect of the words of Allah Azza wa Jal and keeping the company of Allah Azza wa Jal. He says, وَمِنْهَا نَقْضُ الْعَهْدِ مَعَ اللَّهِ Azza wa Jal. Breaking your oath and breaking your promise to Allah Azza wa Jal. Because Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَبِمَا نَقْضِهِمْ مِيثَاقَهُمْ لَعَنَّهُمْ وَجَعَلْنَا قُلُوبَهُمْ قَاسِيَةً He says, because they broke the covenant, meaning the covenant that they have with Allah, we cursed them and we made their hearts hard. So this, this covenant that you have with Allah Azza wa Jal, that if you break, your heart hardens, is the covenant of Islam. That is, Allah Azza wa Jal has a covenant between you and Him. Whether you know it or not, when you're a Muslim, when you accepted Islam, you've accepted this covenant, this ahd, this promise. What is this promise of Islam? That you're going to do to, that when it comes to Allah Azza wa Jal, what are you going to do? To worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone and to obey Him. And Allah in return, because there's a, another side to that covenant. Allah in return, what is He going to give you? Jannah. That's the covenant. That's the mithaq. You don't disobey me and don't worship others with me and Allah will give you jannah in return. So when a person breaks that covenant between them and Allah Azza wa Jal, that hardens the heart. Another part to it is if a person makes a promise to Allah Azza wa Jal. Specific one. That is if a person makes a promise to Allah Azza wa Jal and does not fulfill that promise, that hardens his heart or her heart as well because they did not respect Allah enough 
to keep that promise. So if a person makes a promise to Allah, he or she should keep it as long as it is permissible. They don't break that promise. But in general, halal and haram is the covenant between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said also, وَمِنْهَا and also of the causes that hardens the heart, and this is really relevant for us today, كَثْرَةُ الضَّحِكُ Excessive laughter. Excessive laughter. And notice what I said, excessive laughter. And what he wrote here, excessive laughter. We're not talking about laughter, right? What were we talking about? Excessive laughter. كَثْرَةُ الضَّحِكُ And there's, it's mentioned in the hadith, لا تكثر الضحك and we talked about this hadith a while back لا تكثر الضحك do not laugh excessively because excessive laughter kills the heart excessive laughter kills the heart now tell me how does excessive laughter kill the heart how could it possibly kill the heart now we say not laughter laughter from time to time from time to time you need to laugh naturally it's going to come to you right and no one wants you to be sad and depressed. No. But how can excessive laughter? Okay. No boundaries. There is that. There is no boundaries. Huh? Huh? So you, you just lose right sight of what is appropriate or inappropriate. You begin appropriately, right? You begin appropriately. Okay. And as long as laughter is not excessive, you begin appropriately. But as you move into excessiveness and extreme, what happens? You start crossing lines. Have you noticed that with your friends? You start okay. But then as you keep laughing and laughing and joking and kidding, what, what does it move into? Insulting the other person. Okay? Hurting their feelings or they hurt your feelings. So it goes into things that upset Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And especially today where laughter had become a profession, making people laugh had become a profession. At the time where the Prophet ﷺ talked about this thing, there was no such profession as a comedian. Follow? Now there is such a profession where you would actually turn on the TV or you go online and you could watch a person whose job is what? To make people what? Laugh. And when they make people laugh, what happens? What do, they, what do they make fun of? You tell me. Huh? Other people. So they make fun of other people and how they look and how they talk. Huh? That's what is funny to people. That all of that is haram, right? So-and-so is fat, short, right? He has a uh, no, an, speech impediment. Uh, uh, he did this mistake. I noticed him doing this wrong thing. All of these observations are attacks on other people. Even if it's not a specific person, but if you are that person, you will feel terrible because of it. So you're attacking other people. What else do they attack or make fun of? If you heard them, you'll know. Everything, including who? Including Allah Azza wa Jal. And it's one of the top comedians. Some of the top comedians, the popular ones, if you listen to them, they'll pass through mocking religion and mocking Allah Azza wa Jal while you're sitting and listening to them. And you will laugh. Huh? You will laugh. Or mock taqwa and piety huh? in favor of obscenity and vulgarity. So this is the reality of it as it exists today. So imagine yourself listening to this all the time and then somebody comes and tells you come to the masjid. Your heart is where? Far away, far away from all of that, right? Excessively drowning in that type of laughter, that type of uh, swamp. It's hard for it to be extracted and to actually listen to a Quran that will affect it and move it. So the heart also hardens when there is excessive laughter. Now again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying, saying that you shouldn't laugh and you shouldn't smile. I'm not saying that you shouldn't tell jokes when the jokes are appropriate. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have fun. I'm saying that if this is what you're doing all the time, if this is the only thing that you're interested in, there'll be no place in your heart for anything meaningful, including the name of Allah Azza wa Jal and the Sunnah of His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They'll be too heavy for you. Huh? It'll be too hard for you. So if you want a heart that is alive, 
Avoid excessive laughter. Kathratu al-dahik tumitu al-qalb. He says also, wa minha, kathratu al-akli, overeating. He says also that hardens the heart. He says especially if you're eating haram. So that's clear. Actually, any act of haram adds to the disease of the heart. Now, it makes it a little stiffer and a little harder. A little, a little more irresponsive to what Allah Azza wa Jal wants. So if you want to bring softness back to the heart, you leave out haram or suspicious type of food. And also not to overeat. Now what is the problem with overeating? Why does it hurt in the heart when you overeat? Because when you overeat, what happens? Huh? No. I can't hear you. Stomach will be full, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you hear you. Now you, 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 yeah. Hard to breathe, and if it's hard to breathe, it's hard to do what? Huh? Well, no, I mean, not to that extent. Yeah, no, you're not going to die. Yeah, you're not going to die. But I mean that, okay, if it's hard to breathe, then you're absolutely right. It's like hard to breathe. So you only want to do what? Sit. And you don't want to do anything of value. Right? You don't want to worship. All right? That is, if, you, if you're supposed to still pray Isha, and you eat a lot, are you going to stand up and pray Isha? So I just want to relax. I just want to, I'm so tired. So maybe you'll sleep and you'll miss Isha altogether. Or if you're going to pray Isha, you'll be, oh my God, I'm so tired. I'll just barely stand quickly. Huh? Pray your Isha and go back and sit. Because you just don't have that appetite or energy to do anything. That is pleasing to Allah Azza wa Forget about reading the Quran or doing something. And again, I'm not saying that you need to be doing this all the time. But if you spend your whole night, okay, in other frivolous type of entertainment, and you don't do anything that brings you closer to Allah Azza wa then you lost your night. Your night should be a mix. A mix of fun stuff, but, a mix of, but also some ibadah in it. What we happens, what happens is that we only lean on and emphasize fun and we diminish this ibadah to only a few seconds. So if that is how we spend our night, of course the heart will harden. So I eat a lot and then I drink a lot and I sleep a lot. That's the only thing I want to do. So there is no ibadah or if there is ibadah, the little time that we give to Allah Azza wa Jal, our mind is somewhere else because it is too tired. So kathratul akli. And he says, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he said, he was asked, can a person encounter the softness of his heart if he is full, if his stomach is full? He says, I don't think so. So this tells you about a reason. Minha kathratu dhunub, one of the causes also is sins, especially when they are excessive. One after the other, it kills the heart. It becomes irresponsive. It doesn't care about what Allah Azza wa wants. Why? Because it had practiced not caring. Practice not caring. When you commit one sin and you say Astaghfirullah and you feel shy and embarrassed, that means that your heart is still has life in it. When you stop caring, it means that heart has died or is close to it or is very sick. Because every time that you sin, you practice not caring about Allah Azza wa The next time I don't care about Allah. The third time I don't care about Allah. So when somebody comes and tells you Allah said, so I already don't care. I'm already very far. I'm already, that heart has already has this bar these barriers around it. Nothing gets in. So that's why the more that you commit of a sin, the harder it is for somebody to wake you up. And you may say, just like the people of the book, we know. I know, what are you telling me? I know this hadith. I know this ayah. But the issue is that not you know it or not. The issue is, are you willing to follow it? So the person who is reminding you isn't always reminding you of things that you do not know. He's reminding you of things that you ought to do. Right? Now, He says, الْقَسْوَة He says, the things that remove the hardness of the heart. He says, كَثْرَةُ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي يَتَوَاطَعُ عَلَيْهِ الْقَلْبُ وَالْلِسَانِ He says, Mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often, a type of remembrance, a type of dhikr where the heart is, uh, has joined the tongue in remembering Allah azza wa jal. 
uh, has synced with the tongue in the remembrance of Allah. So we know that there is dhikr of Allah that is on the tongue alone. And that's the easiest one. And there's a dhikr of Allah Azza wa that could happen only inside the heart where you're thinking about Allah. Here we're talking about a dhikr of Allah that is both internal and external. When you remember Allah, but the heart also has joined the tongue in that remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. So someone said to uh, Al-Hassan, he said, I want to I'm com- I want to give you or I want to complain to you about my, the stiffness of my heart. So he said, bring it closer to the remembrance of Allah, to the dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. And Wahb ibn al-Ward, he says, لم نجد شيئا أرق لهذه القلوب ولا أشد استجلابا للحق من قراءة القرآن لمن تدبره. He says we didn't find anything that is softer or more softening of the heart and thing that will bring the truth fastest to it than reading the Quran with contemplation and pondering. Right? Now, why is the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal? Why does it have such an effect? So. Think about those, that, that first person who he said to Al-Hasan, rahimahullah, he said, I have this problem. And this problem that I have is that my heart is hard. That in fact can happen, meaning that as we complain about physical sickness and we feel that there is something wrong and we go to a doctor and ask him for medicine, Right? And how many times have we done this? Something is wrong with us, so we go and look for the medicine, and we go to the doctor. We have to do the same thing for our religion and our heart. The same thing. So if you find that you are reading the Qur'an, or, tra- or if you find yourself wanting to read the Qur'an, but unwilling to read it, you know that you should read it, but you don't want to read it. You don't feel like you want to read it. You feel that you attend the khutbah, you listen to everything, but none of it has entered your heart. You feel that the commands of Allah Azza wa Jal are heavy and undesirable, whereas the other opposite path is desirable and bringing you happiness and joy. If you find yourself unhappy in general, depressed in general, anxious in general, all of these are signs that there is something wrong with our heart. Sickness. So just like when my hand is not working, when my leg is not working, when I have a headache, I go and find a solution. When you're suffering from all of these things, then the question is, why aren't we seeking a solution for all of them? So he says, I now recognize the problem. I have a problem here. Problem is that I'm not responding to what Allah wants from me. I hear the Quran, but I don't cry. I'm not affected. I'm not attracted to it. I hear what Allah wants. I don't want to do it. What is this? What is this? Is this a sign of? I'm envious, I'm proud, I get angry very quickly, I'm not happy. Even when good things happen, I'm not happy. And when bad things happen, I blame Allah Azza wa Jalla. What is all of that? That is a sign that the heart is unhappy and not healthy. So that's why he goes to someone, ask him, he says, I have a problem here. What do I do about it? And that is a person who is seeking a solution. No one is going to come and knock on your door and tell you, I can want to come and fix you. You need to seek that medication for yourself and for those that you care about. So what did he say? Dhikrullah Azza wa Jal. That's the the first thing that is going to start melting that heart and bringing it back to Allah Azza wa Jal. Because it does what? It removes away what? Sin. It removes the sins away. When you remember Allah, it takes that sin away. One sin away, the second sin, the third sin, the fourth sin, and so on, and so on, and so on. It also reminds you of, and we'll be talking about it, reminds you of the hereafter. Reminds you of reality of this life. Brings peace to your heart. Starts cleaning it. And he says, nothing is better than reading the Quran with tadabbur, with contemplation. Now, you're getting getting the answers you are getting the answers at this moment right whether we follow them or not that is up to you and me but you're getting the answers at this moment at least at least remember them he says there's nothing better than if you are suffering from anything on the inside and you don't have control over your heart anymore he says bring it closer to the quran and read it with contemplation understand what allah is saying to you 
and you'll find that your heart will change. But you need to give it time. Now, I'm going to ask you, how much time? It, it depends. It depends on you. A person could read an ayah and start crying. With me? A person could read an ayah and can start crying. And a person could read the entire Quran and he did not understand or benefit. How long? It depends on you. Because your sickness is not like my sickness. And your need is not like my need. So you need to keep reading and reading and reading and making dua and understanding until some of those ayahs go deep inside your heart and they move it. And then you know that it started to work. So there is no one specific time where you need one page and you say, hey, nothing happened. I'm quitting. You read it for a day and you say, nothing happened. I'm quitting. Well, did you just do your sins for just half an hour? Were your sins because of the accumulation of just one hour? Were my sins the accumulation of only one day? Or I've been practicing these things for years? Like I've been sinning for how many? Years. And I want one page of the Quran. It has the power. The problem is not with that. The problem is with me. So I want one page of the Quran or one half, one half hour of reading to fix everything? No. It's like taking an axe and striking rock until you reach the person inside. How long will it take? Well, it depends on the thickness of the rock, isn't it? And how strong the axe is and how strong you hit. So if you, strung, uh, you hit really strong and your axe is really sharp and the rock layer is thin, you're going to penetrate easily. But if the layer is really thick, and your axe is weak and you don't have energy, you need to keep hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting until it cracks. Then you're gonna get in. How long? Allah Azza wa Jal knows. But don't stop trying. So, dhikrullahi Azza wa Jal, It says, and this is something we talked about before, he's qalbi khamsatu ashya. He says, the medicine of the heart are five things. Reading the Quran with contemplation, and having an empty stomach, meaning not overeating. وَقِيَامُ layl, Praying at night. وَالتَّضَرُّ عِنْدَ sahar, Praying to Allah, making dua in the last part of the night just before Fajr. وَمُجَالَسَةُ الصَّالِحِينَ And keeping the company of the pious. You follow? So if you have something in your heart, you, we know what the medicine is. This is what can I do? It says read the Quran and think about what you are reading and learn from it. And don't overeat. And at night, pray. And before Fajr, that last part of the night before Fajr, make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal and seek the pious and sit with them and let them remind you of Allah Azza wa Jal. He says, وَمِنْهَا الْإِحْسَانُ إِلَى الْيَتَامَ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ He says also part of it, part of what softens the heart is kindness to the orphans and those who are poor. And the Prophet wasallam said, somebody came, and we talked about this before, long time, long, long time ago. A man complained to the Prophet wasallam about the hardness of his heart. He says, if you love for your heart to soften, إِنْ أَحْبَبْتَ أَنْ يَلِينَ قَلْبُكْ فَامْسَحْ رَأْسَ الْيَتِيمِ وَأَطْعِمِ الْمَسَاكِينَ Wipe over the head of the orphan and feed the poor. Meaning, come close to who? The weak. Huh? The weak, the unfortunate those who are sick, those who, those who had been stricken with calamities, come close to them, then your heart will soften. Why will it soften? Because you naturally will feel mercy, feel that rahmah. And you will naturally also see the bounties of Allah Azza wa Jalla upon you. So when you're close to someone who's like that, you'll also remember that what has happened to them could also happen to you. And that none of the things that keep you distracted and occupied is in reality a thing to distract and occupy. That is, if what is keeping me, if what is keeping me away from Allah Azza wa Jal is wealth, and I find someone who is miskeen, doesn't have any money, and who needs the very basics of need, which I have, and I help him, 
I also realize that as he is suffering, I also could be what? Suffering. So I could lose my money. So this money is really of no real value because it does not last. You with me? It doesn't last. So if I lose it, what's going to happen to me? So you stop relying on it. You stop trusting it. You stop allowing it to change you. The more that you stay with those who are stricken with those calamities and are unfortunate in life, they lost their parents, they lost loved ones, they are poor, they need help. When you see this, you know that none of the things that occupy us, subhanAllah, are worthy of that. And just think about it, just think about it in terms of the following. If, may God yani keep everybody healthy, but if somebody comes to you, you go to the doctor, you did not, do not feel well, and the doctor gives you news of a terminal illness, meaning that you have only six months to live. That's it. And only if Allah knows uh, basically uh, and eventually how long you're going to live, but the diagnosis is, the likelihood is, you're going to live for only six months. What is your money to you at that moment? Nothing, right? What is a new song that's going to, you know, be released in two weeks? What is that going to mean to you? Will you be able to enjoy it? Now I'm serious. I mean, a new song is going to come out in a month. Are you going to enjoy it? Okay, a basketball game that's going to be played in town between this big team and that big team. Are you going to go? I'm not going to see the end of the season. What is this all for? So none of these things in this life that distract you and occupy you, a new movie is going to be released. So I'm going to see a movie and I know while I'm in the movie I'm dying. Am I going to go? I'm not going to go. So then you'll discover what really is important in life. Then your heart will soften. Then where do you go? Where will people find you? In the masjid. You found you in the masjid. Why are you in the masjid? Yeah. To pray, because that's the only thing that is left. You know that's the only thing that is of value. That's the only thing that's going to help you. None of these other things is in fact of meaning. The only meaning is here. So this is what it means. Why is the heart hard? Because you think that you have a lot and that it is enough and you live forever. When you discover that you're not, all of that is, goes away. And you discover that the only thing that is of meaning is sitting in this life. And he says also, وَمِنْهَا كَثْرَةُ ذِكْرِ الْمَوْتِ Remembering death often. As uh, the Prophet ﷺ did command that, أَكْثِرُ ذِكْرَ هَادِمِ That Remember death often. So uh, it is reported that a woman came to Aisha radiallahu anha and she asked her, she says, I find this stiffness in my heart. It's not responsive. It's not alive. He says, remember the death often because there your uh, heart will soften as a result and you'll be able to do what you want to do, meaning of what is pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal. So she did that and her heart changed. So the more that you remember Allah Azza wa Jal and that your end is death, the more that your heart will be under control and you'll be able to direct it the way that you want to direct it and if you don't remember death then your heart will rebel and run away from you and seek this dunya so you'll be able to tame your heart by remembering death and if not the heart will run like a wild beast after this world and will not listen to anybody or anything right remember death and your heart will listen to you and he says also وَمِنْهَا Ziyaratul Quburi bit tafakkuri fi hali ahliha wa masirihim. He says, visiting the graves and thinking about their end and what happened to the people who are there. Right? So, um, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, somebody asked him, Ma yuriqu qalbi, what is the thing that is going to soften my heart? He said, visit the grave, visit the cemetery. Go and visit the cemetery. And he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, zurul qubur, visit the graves because they remind you of death. And then he said in another hadith, they remind you of the hereafter. Okay? They remind you of the hereafter. And especially if they visit the graves, you can visit the graves of non Muslims, the cemeteries of the non Muslims. For those types of reflections, you can also do that as well. And if you do that, you'll discover something interesting. Because, of course, there are these headstones, right? 
you know, the non-Muslims, they have these headstones. And on the headstone, you can almost read the entire history of that human being. Because they tell you, okay, he was born on that date. And maybe sometimes they'll tell you who he was born in that area or in that country. And then he died on that. And he left behind. There's a story to it. So the more that you read, you'll discover the life of a person. He was born on a for, in a foreign land on such and such day, in such and such year. He lived this long, 60 years, 50 years, 40 years. Some die very young, some die old. And then he died in that, that year, in that place. And he's now here. And you think about it. This person was on earth, above ground, for 50 years. And he was born in the year this and that. And he was a child then. And as I was a child or a young boy, he had dreams about what he wants to be. I'm going to go here. I will do that. As a young man, he had these dreams as well. And he got married maybe or not. He had children or not. But eventually, life ends and he's there and you think about this is one life and this is another life and this is another life and this is another life and all those people were alive at a time when I wasn't and there will come a time when I'll be underground and somebody will be passing by and he will see my story as well he was born on that day and he died on that day and I had all those dreams but what did I do with all of that when I was on earth and what is my situation now under earth so when you see all of that, it really puts it all in its proper perspective that I may think that I have this and that, but I don't. I may think I'm, that I'm going to be alive for a long time, but I'm not. I'm just one person, one story among many other stories, and it's going to end the same way. So then you will know that, let me do something about it so that when I'm underground, at least that home is better than what was on earth, what's under should be better than what is on earth. So then your heart will respond to you if you say, remember Allah, will respond to you when you say, read the Quran, will respond to you when you say, stay away from this haram. Now it's easier to stay away from it because I know that if I do this haram, it will follow me to my grave. If you do this haram, it will follow you to your grave. And you don't want to see that haram in your grave. So cleanse yourself, protect yourself from it, so that when you go in, you go in clean. And if you go in clean, you'll be happy forever. And he says also, and this is connected, learning lessons from what happened to perished nations. Uh, similar to what we talked about, going to the grave and seeing those cemeteries and remembering that this is going to happen to every single person. So this is basically the sum of what he said, rahimahullah. So what's important here is to realize it as a problem. It's enough of a problem that Allah Azza wa Jal talked about it in the Quran. And he warned the believers not to fall victims to that common, very common disease. And it's a very common disease because... The problem with it is not ignorance. You can read the entire Qur'an. I'm telling you, you could memorize the entire Qur'an and have it. You could memorize Sunnah and you can still have it. It's not about how much you know, but it's about what you do with what you know. So you have to take it seriously. And that this life of yours and this life of mine is not worth upsetting Allah Azza wa Jal if we want to live it. Because it is going to end. So we need to capture our hearts back. Our hearts had, had fallen victims to a, mat a material assault, a very fierce material assault from this dunya. So we need to rescue our hearts back and say, it is okay to study and to graduate and to earn you know, enough money and to even be rich if you want to be rich. But don't make that the center of your life and the cause of your existence. The center of your life should be that I want to please Allah Azza wa Jal because whatever I do in this life, whatever I achieve in it, is going to end. Achieve whatever you want to achieve as long as it is halal, but it is going to end. So make your achievements something that is pleasing to Allah, not displeasing to Him. And rescue your heart from being too preoccupied with this world. Bring it back. How do you bring it back? Keep remembering Allah. Keep reading the Quran. Keep learning the lessons there. Keep praying on time. Keep making dua to Allah Azza wa Jal to protect you from the fate 
of the previous nations. Keep remembering death. Keep staying away from the haram. And if you commit something, or even if you don't, keep saying astaghfirullah frequently. Frequently, frequently, and asking Allah to protect you from the fitan, whatever they are. And asking Allah Azza wa Jal to give you a heart that is a living heart. A heart that is free of sin, free of shirk, free of bid'ah. A heart that is close to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you find that you are starting to develop symptoms of sickness, and I talked about some of these symptoms. If you're starting to develop symptoms where you do not care about what Allah has said, you have a lot of doubts and questions that are unanswered. You are suffering from depression and tightness in the chest, anxiety, um, just perplexity in general then you know that there is something internal that needs to be fixed. So rush and fix it as you fix any external problem that you have. So I'll stop here inshallah and see if you have questions, let me know and I'll be happy inshallah to answer. But the important thing inshallah is to take this and reflect on it.